Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis Daly. I spent 20 years with United Press International, most of it with the old UPI radio network. And my favorite assignment was going on the road producing and hosting American Montage. It was an hour-long weekly program. Now here's an edited version of one of those shows. And we had great fun one week on American Montage when we were invited to tour Disneyland. It coincided with the opening of the exciting Indiana Jones ride. Our host was John McClintock, the chief publicist at the time for Disneyland, and I asked him whether or not it was true that in the very beginning there was nothing there where Disneyland is today but a lot of orange groves. No, that's absolutely right. That Walt looked very carefully at a place where he could build a park that he wanted to build. And so in 1955, when the park opened, uh, it was relatively small. We're on Main Street, USA. You can hear the horses there in the background. Uh, and, uh, and this was one of the original parts of Disneyland. In fact, although some of it looks like it was built yesterday, uh, it was very much as it was in 1955, as is the Sleeping Beauty Castle straight ahead of us. Uh, much of the rest of the park, however, has grown considerably. There have been new lands added, a lot of new attractions. Indiana Jones is only the latest. We opened a new land a couple of years ago with Mickey's Toontown back behind Fantasyland. Um, so uh, a lot of interesting things have developed over those years, and probably the most remarkable part of the whole story is that in 1955, one of the reasons the park was so small is that nobody thought it would work. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was as big as Walt could afford to build it, and he couldn't find many investors, so uh, wow. it was a real issue as to uh, whether he was going to lose his shirt on the park, and it was not only a huge success, but it was for many years the financial backbone of the Disney company. Well, I know, as you say, you've been able to expand, but I I would think that in a way, it's not a terrible encumbrance, but uh, in retrospect, you would have wished that Walt would have bought more land because you're in an enviable position, maybe learning from that experience with the amount of land that the company has in Florida. Well, of course, Walt himself wished that he could have bought more land, uh, and Florida was in a way a reaction to that, that he, he didn't like the idea of other, other people building sort of tacky-looking hotels right adjoining his park. So, uh, so Florida, of course, is a big chunk of property, a great deal of which has never been developed. Here at Disneyland, uh, we have total of about 250 acres, including our parking lot. And uh, every inch of that has been developed, uh, at least for parking, if for nothing else. Uh, so uh, we, when we do something, we usually have to take something out, although we have what we refer to as onstage and backstage, and there's still enough backstage area that when we build a Splash Mountain or a Toontown or an Indiana Jones, we don't have to take something out because there, is still, there are still warehouses and parking spaces and things that we can remove to build our new attractions. You know, one of the, the things that I see as being so far-sighted back then, and I really don't know why it hasn't caught on in more places, was putting up the monorail system to move people. I mean, if there's, a, if there's ever been a company that's an expert at moving people around, it's the Disney company. It's not just the monorail, although we're very proud of that because it is literally an American... And by literally, I mean it has been designated as an American engineering landmark. It was the first daily operating monorail system in the Western Hemisphere, and it still takes people to and from Disneyland and the Disneyland Hotel every day of the year. But since that time, we've developed additional transportation systems, uh, probably the best known of which is our people mover system that runs through Tomorrowland and which has actually been adapted for use outside of the Disney theme parks. Certain airports use similar uh, transportation systems. But uh, we, have, we have relatively slow seasons. How important is it to theme parks in general, and, and has it been to Disneyland, to every so often come up with a new attraction? I mean, I'm, I'm sure just monetarily and letting everybody see them, you can't do one a year. But how, how much stock did you all put into the new ride? Well, there are two answers to that. Um, one is that it's the conventional wisdom in the theme park business in general that you do add a new ride every year. And the reason that many theme parks are able to do this is that there are companies from which you can, in effect, buy a roller coaster off the rack uh, if, you, if you want to add something to your park. 
Uh, what makes it a challenge for the Disney theme parks is that we can't do that. Everything we do is built from the ground up. And in the case of the Indiana Jones attraction, which was 10 years from conception to realization, there was technology that literally had to be invented before we could build the attraction. Okay, we've arrived at the uh, the reason why we're here, and that's the, the Indy Jones ride. The, first, the fact, first thing you see is that big old truck from the movie. And that is, in fact, the big old truck from the movie. You're absolutely right. That's the truck that uh, Harrison Ford did, uh, or his stuntman, did the stunts on in Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you look closely at the front of it, you'll even see some handles and things that served as stunt apparatus during the filming of the movie. Do I understand right that the really innovative thing about this ride, uh, above and beyond all the technology, is the fact that for the most part, it's never the same? That's absolutely right. We are standing right now at the entrance to the Temple of the Forbidden Eye, as it's called, and uh, it's in Adventureland. It's right in the jungle that you ride past during the Jungle Cruise, and in, in fact, you and I are now part of the tour, and Jungle Cruise tour guides will probably be saying rude things about us as they go past. Uh, the legend of the temple, which is also a part of the ride, and as you go into the temple, which of course is still part of what Disney refers to as pre-show, and everybody else in the world refers to as waiting in line, uh, as you go through the temple, there is a lot of story that is told to you as you go through, in the form of hieroglyphics on the walls, special scenes, special icons of various sorts, and the legend of the temple basically is that as as you go in, you are offered one of three great gifts, and you have to choose a door to go through to, uh, to accept that gift. So at the very beginning of the ride, there's one of three directions that you can go into. However, the downside of the Legend of the Temple is that you don't get your gift if that you look into the eyes of the idol. And of course, we've designed it so that it's impossible not to look into the eyes of the <laughs> idol. And when you do that, all hell breaks loose. I uh, see. From there on in, you're, you're going through all the adventures that you associate with the Indian Indiana Jones movies, uh, snakes and bugs, and of course the giant rolling boulder. Can I back and... out now? <laughs> Wow, and what a ride the Indiana Jones attraction is at Disneyland. A little rough, though, and we elected not to tape record while we were riding it. After John McClintock and I parted company, I went to what is my favorite attraction at Disneyland. It was, and it always will be, and that's the Star Tours ride. <laughs> As you are queued up in the line, you see R2-D2 and C-3PO working on a spacecraft, and finally you get into what amounts to a flight simulator, and the ride is absolutely phenomenal. This is Captain Rex from the cockpit. I know this is probably your first flight, and it's mine too. <laughs> You suddenly begin to worry because a robot is your captain. You're sitting with a group of people looking over his shoulders out the front window of what is purportedly a starship. I see they're loading our navigator R2-D2, and then we'll be on our way. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. The problem is the pilot really doesn't know how to drive. And the first thing you know, you're actually in a room being hydraulically moved up and down and back and forth. But what you see in front of you accentuates the action. <laughs> think you're going to die. Almost rear-ended somebody. I'll tell you, you really have to hold on. This was rougher than my flight out here. Oh! You'll have to pardon me. Every time I go on a ride, I giggle. I'm not really sure how far the spacecraft actually moves, but as I mentioned, what you see out the window accentuates the feeling of movement. Health insurance. And as you can tell, I'm not the only one having fun. It's a good thing I don't get car sick. And there you have it, another edited episode of one of the American Montage programs prepared for the UPI Radio Network back in the 1980s and 90s. I'm Dennis Daly. Thanks for listening. Thanks for going with me this week. 
and check YouTube for more American Montage programs.